Welcome back to the Retro Remix project in Unity. In this video we will take a closer look at the first game, Roller Maze. So we open the main menu for the game from the Scenes folder and the Roller Maze folder. And there's not too much going on here. You can see we have a camera of course and a few UI elements and a game manager. The UI items are the main screen and a high score screen attached below as a child. And of course, we have the name input panel where we can input our name to start the game. The game manager has some information, for example, about the levels we can play in this game. And these are scriptable objects that contain information about the level. For example, which music to play, the name of the level, and so on. The game manager is a singleton and will stay between scenes, which means it will not get destroyed when a new scene gets loaded. There's also a small sound manager here that's also a singleton and can be accessed from anywhere in the game. So let's move on to the first level of the game. You can find it in the scenes folder, scene level one. Here you can see how the game looks like and this is the UI part of course and here you can find the actual level. Again, we have our main camera, of course, and we have our player, the rolling ball. That's them. And we have a level grid with four different tile maps. We will take a closer look in a moment. We also have the game manager in here, and it's the same game manager prefab than we have in the main menu. And I said that the game manager survives a level change, a scene change. So when we're coming from the main menu, usually we would have two game managers in here. But the game manager is set up in a way that it will detect if another game manager or an instance of itself exists in the scene and then it destroys itself. So we will always just have one game manager. So why put it here in the first place? That's very convenient if you want to test the scene because you need the game manager for that and you don't want to start the game always by opening the main menu scene and then play all the levels. For example, if you have 50 levels and want to test level 50, you don't want to play all 49 levels before that. So putting the game manager in here allows you to start each level from the scene. There's also UI, of course, and the UI manager has references to all text fields in the UI. For example, the level number, level name, and a few extras like the number of keys or the number of lives, etc. The UI manager also has a reference to the player because when the player gets changed in any way, for example, if they pick up a key or money or a diamond, or if they lose a life, then we send an event to the UI manager and the UI manager is looking up the value it needs to update the UI. The ball bar here is a bit special because it uses a vertical layout group for the balls with a negative spacing. Usually the vertical layout group stacks the images under each other, but if you have a negative spacing, they get stacked up on each other. For example, if we deactivate ball number five, it gets removed from the top. You can play around with the value a bit to see what it means. So let's take a look at the most important part or second most important part, the rolling ball. Let's start the game.
and you can see it's a ball that has nice smooth movement in the texture and it appears to be a 3D ball, a 3D object, but that's not the case. If we go into 3D mode, you can see it's just a simple sprite. So for the effect of the ball, we use a special shader. It takes a texture and spherifies it and moves it accordingly to the movement of the ball. We will make a detailed video for the shader later on. The player also has exposed many variables that can help you to test. For example, you can increase your lives or give yourself a few keys if you want to open a door and don't have any keys at that position. So let's stop it for now. And the most important part for this game, of course, is the tile map feature of Unity. Like I said, we have four tile maps and in case you don't have any experience with tile maps, there are very good tutorials on YouTube about that. I will just briefly show you how to set them up here. First, we can open the tile palette window and then we already have created a tile palette here. The palette contains all the tiles you can use. To create a palette, you can go in that submenu and then you can add tiles to the palette. And the way to do it is for this game, we have a sprite sheet that contains all tiles for the game. Let's open the sprite editor. You can see all the tiles are sliced here and named accordingly. And now you can just drag a sprite into the palette and Unity will ask you where to save the tile asset for that sprite. Then you can use them by selecting a desired tile map and start painting. A nice feature is that if you change the underlying image, the sprite sheet, not the sprites or the assets, really the image that is used, the assets get updated automatically and you can see your changes in the tile map you already painted. And how do we create a tile map? We can choose game object, tile map, and there are several versions of tile maps. In our case, we use the rectangular one. And Unity creates a grid component for us and inserts a tile map below that. That's already done here. We have the one grid and four different tile maps. The lowest tile map is the void tile map. That's all the tiles, the graphics in the background. That's where the player can fall into. And there's one specialty about that layer. I have a parallax movement script added. And the effect of that is that the tile map will move at a different speed in relation to the other tile maps. You can notice it in the background. It seems to move in a distance that is farther away. You can play with that value. If you set it to zero, the time map will move at the same speed as the others, meaning it won't move at all in relation to the camera. And if we set it to one, it will move at the same speed as the camera. So it's fixed. And if you choose a value between those extremes, you get a nice trade-off and the parallax effect. The next tile map is the floor tile map. On this tile map, all floor tiles and special floor tiles are painted. You can see it's a lot and we need this extra tile map because you can 
only have one tile at one position per tile map. So if you want to add an item on the floor, you need to do it on another tile map. We can't have a floor tile and an item tile at the same tile map. And later, if we are taking a look in the code, we will see how the player controller that moves the ball will look for special tiles in the floor tile map and change its behavior accordingly. The next tile map above the floor is the obstacle tile map. And in the code, it's set up that everything in the obstacle tile map is something the player will collide with. So we can't even break out, out of these barriers or can't pass these cones. Please note that we have those colliders of all these tiles fused together as one single collider. That is done by adding a composite collider component to the layer and then checking this checkbox used by composite in the time of collider component. If we uncheck it, you can see the green outlines. You have them per tile instead of one big collider. And if you paint many tiles, then you will have many colliders. And with each collider, the performance gets a bit worse. I think for this kind of game and this map size, it does not really matter, but it's good to know. And since we don't need the single colliders, we can just check it and combine them into one big collider. The next layer we have is the items tile map. The items tile map contains everything else. You can go on and add a few extra tile maps for organization. For example, put the teleporters or explosions we will see in a minute on extra tile maps. But for my purposes, it was sufficient to put them all in this items tile map. Here we also use this composite collider. And you may wonder why. And how do we pick up single objects? Usually if you collide with a game object, you can detect which game object it is and react accordingly. But since we're not using the usual on collider enter, on trigger enter from Unity, we don't need to detect which object we collided with because these are not game objects. These are tiles on the tile map. And we have one single collider and we check when we collide with anything on that tile map, we take a look in the tile map at that position, what tile is present, and then we can react to that. So these are no game objects, but of course, there's an exception to that. And if we fold that out, we can see there's a data layer. It has nothing to do with tile maps. It's just a game object that I inserted here as a folder for other game objects. So why do we need the data layer? We have a few tiles that need extra information. You don't need extra information on the red lock. It's just a red lock. You don't need extra information on the green diamond. It's a green diamond and if you collect it, you get your points. But for the teleporter, for example, you want to know where the player gets teleported to. And sadly, in the standard tiles of the tile maps, there is no possibility to add extra data. There are a few solutions in the asset store you can check out, but I didn't want to use any extra plugins for that project you have to download or to buy even. So I found another solution for that problem. Let's take a look at that teleporter data, for example. It's just a script I wrote and here we can enter a destination and a color. And this will help me to find my teleporter and my destination for the teleporter on the map. It's very useful if you have multiple teleporters. For example, we have here a second teleporter. And if we change the color to blue, we can see 
this blue teleporter will teleport the player to that blue location and the red teleporter to the red location. And if you change the values here, you can see where the destination moves. So you might wonder, okay, when I'm hitting a teleporter, how do I know which teleporter data to use? Since the teleporters are only tiles and not game objects, we can't just drag that data and put it in the inspector on that tile or the game object. And the way it works is just that this game object is put on the same position as the teleporter tile and has a collider itself. And when the player hits the teleporter tile, then we'll take a look is there any game object at that position? Or to be more precise, we make a physics check on the data layer. All these objects here are on the data layer. And see if we collide with any objects. And if yes, teleporter data is found, then the information of the destination is read out and the player is put to that position. But that is not the only exception, of course. And we will see that in level number two. Here you can see, for example, why this coloring is useful. You might get confused otherwise. So let's take a look at the other exception we have to make where we have to use real game objects instead of tiles. Let's start the scene and take a look at what's going on here. You can see a few tiles are animated. For example, this coin has a rotating animation and also the explosion. And the way that is done, if you want to have a tile that gets animated, let's bring up the tile palette again. You can see this is a coin and you can just place it anywhere. And that was created as an animated tile. And the way that works, if you want to have an animated tile, we have for example these five animation sprites for the coin. And if you select them here as single sprites, coin one to five, you can just drag them here because then Unity will want to create six single sprites from them. You have to go to your tiles folder and then create 2D tiles and animate a tile by hand. And we have done this for the coins. You can see it here. Let's close this up and you can see here it's an animated tile. It also has a different icon and you can drag and drop sprites through that list. You can add more or you can delete some. And then you have drag that animated tile into the tile palette. And when you put such an animated tile on the map, it will automatically play this animation of these sprites. You can configure the speed or start time or start frame. And you can also set a collider type. For example, it doesn't have to have a collider or you can use the grid as a collider or you want to use the shape of the sprite as a collider. And let's take another look at the sprite sheet. We have to stop it first. Here we can see generate physics shapes is checked. So they are generated automatically depending on the shape of the sprite. It's not a problem for that sprite. You can see Unity creates a shape following that outline. But if you want to create more detail or want to have a different shape, you can do that. And the sprite editor 
by selecting a sprite, for example, that explosion sprite, and select custom physics sprite. Here you can drag a rectangle and add points and move them to a position that gives you the custom shape. For example, at that shape of the animation, we want the player to get damage at every point inside that shape, and here only if they are still at the center. So that means that the shape of the collider, or the trigger, changes during the animation. And that is something the animated tile cannot do. If we take another look at the coin, if you set the collider type to sprite, then only one collider, I think it's the last one, will be taken and it will stay fixed during the animation. Here you can see the shape stays the same. And we don't want that for the explosion, because the player should be able to navigate through when the explosion is fading out. And we don't want any collider when the explosion is gone. So we can't use an animated tile for that. But there is also another solution for that. On the items layer, we have a new script. It's called Replace Tiles with Game Objects. And what it does, you can fill a list of tile assets you created. For example, this is our explosion, number three. We have that and the tile palette. Here it is. And it's only a single tile and not an animation tile, but you can just place it on the map. And then in this script, we can say we want that tile to be replaced with a game object. And this has to be a prefab, for example, the explosion prefab. And when the game starts, the script will run through the tile map it's on and is looking for all these tiles. And when it finds one, it will remove it completely from the tile map and replace it with the prefab at the same position. So let's try it out. You can already see the collision shape is changing nicely and is also vanishing when the explosion is not there. So let's fold this out. And the game objects that get created are placed on the tile map. Let's take a look, for example, at this game object. You can see it's just a normal game object. I can deactivate or activate. And that is the explosion prefab. And what makes this prefab special is that I implemented the animation of the explosion not with an animation tile but with a sprite switcher script. Let's pause it for a minute. It's similar to the animation tile in that regard that we can add multiple sprites that you want to use in the animation. For example, these are the eight sprites for the explosion and the last element is null. So we don't want any sprite there. You can set a switch time. How many seconds should be waited between a switch of two tiles? You can set it to looping and to auto start. And you can also insert a tile sequence. That means that it's your own playlist for the sprites. They don't have to play it in that order, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. But you can say, I want to play 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 4, 3, and so on. You can create your own loops. Or you can, for example, what I did here, you can let the null sprite stay for three cycles. So when the explosion finishes, there will be a greater delay with no sprite where the player can pass.
and the sprite switcher script makes sure that the collider gets changed as well according to each sprite. We will take a closer look in the next video where we will take a look in the code. So that's pretty much everything in a rough overview of what is going on in the level scenes of Roller Maze. We will get into more detail when we get into the actual scripts in another video where we will take a look into the code of all these elements. If you want to see more of those videos, make sure to subscribe to the channel. I will upload videos in the following weeks. But you should already be able to try things out in this game with the knowledge from this video. If you have any more questions, just let me know in the comments or come to the Discord. Happy creating, until the next time.